soul. There are many terms in Mandarin for the soul. So naturally, one question was, hey, can you cover all the different variations of Mandarin expressions for the soul? And I said yes to start with, but then I got to thinking that I want to make sure my presentations are as practical as possible for everyone. So rather than just to talk about the variations, all the different characters that can mean soul, what I wanted to do was that I wanted to dig a little bit deeper so that it can be more beneficial for everyone. So here's what I mean. Question, how do you, how do you say soul in Mandarin? So the quick answer, the short answer is Ling Huan. So you'll see the pinyin here. And if you try to sound out the pinyin, it's like Ling Han. So that's close, but it's actually closer to Ling Huan. So the second sound is a little bit tricky. It has kind of a kind of a oo sound in, in it. Hun. So it's not like hun, like honey. So Ling Huan means the soul in Mandarin. So the interesting thing about Ling Huan is that this is a direct equivalent to the English word, more so than the other translations that you come across from time to time. So among all the words that you can translate between languages, occasionally you get words that translate you know, to a particular word that is close, but not quite because of cultural differences. In this case, Ling Huan actually has pretty much 100% correspondence. In other words, anytime you use the English word soul, even when you're not specifically talking about this intangible spirits, this immortal soul that uh, people allegedly possess from a religious perspective, metaphysical perspective, even when you're not talking about that, using soul with a different definition, different context, you actually find that the same context exists, the same nuance exists in Mandarin as well. And that's why I call it a direct equivalent. So let's uh, do a, a few examples. For instance, we talk about soulmate all the time in English. So in Mandarin, you start with the same two characters that means soul, and then follow by two additional characters, which mean companion, you know, the person who keeps you company. So soul companion is the, will be the literal translation of that, but the meaning is soulmate. So you can use it in that way. That's one equivalent. So here's another one. Ling Huan Zhi Chuang. So if I were to break it down character by character, the first two still would be so, and then we have a character which is the apostrophe S, yes, and then we have the last character which means window. So literally it means so's window, which is what we would say, the window to the soul. When we say window to the soul, we're talking about the, the eyes. And when we say Ling Huan Zi Chuang, so's window, we're talking about the eyes, same thing. So same, same way of utilizing that particular character in different contexts. Here's another one, Ling Huan Ren Wu. So again, we begin with the two characters that means the soul, and then we have two characters, which means a person or a figure. So soul person, well, we don't have that exactly in English. It's a key figure, a central figure, an essential figure in a group of people. Like for instance, when we say the soul of the team, the community, community the soul of the community, etc., the soul of a, a group of people. Um, those of you who, um, who follow the NBA, basketball uh, may recall that once upon a time, basketball player Derek Fisher was considered to be the soul of the team, the Lakers. So that's one example. And we actually use that, you know, soul in the exact same way, except that in Mandarin, you will add 
uh, figure or person right behind it to make it explicit. And then one more usage that may surprise you, Ling Huan Yin Yue, soul music. So in English, you would associate that with African American culture, rightfully so. Now in Mandarin, it's actually exactly the same. So Ling Huan Yin Yue corresponds to soul music. So these are these are the ways of using soul, uh, the two characters in Mandarin that correspond to the English word soul. So then I think logically your next question may may be something like, well, what does the Tao Te Ching say about the soul? Like that. So here's the answer. Uh, not a whole lot. The only direct reference is the beginning of chapter 10. And that beginning says, in holding the soul and embracing oneness, can one be steadfast without straying? So in the other 80 chapters of the Tao Te Ching, there are no further references, direct references to the soul. Now, why? Well, it's because the focus of the ancient sages was more on the life we're living right now less on the continuation of the soul beyond this mortal existence. So it's like I keep saying, the ancient sages had a very practical perspective. They are kind of different from the ethereal way that sometimes you come across, perhaps in new age circles. So they were very practical, very down to earth. Now, Zhuangzi did write about the, the hereafter in a metaphorical way through his stories. So a better question to ask, other than what does the Tao Te Ching say about the soul, a better question may be, what does the Tao say about the soul? Or what does the Tao teach us about the soul? Because, you know, there's a lot more to Tao teachings than just the Tao Te Ching. So perhaps we can explore a little bit the story that Zhuangzi had written to talk about the soul. So it's the story of the crying princess. If you have my books, you will easily recognize that this story appears in my first book, The Tao of Daily Life, as well as my last book, The Tao of Happiness. I wrote them in different ways. And that's, uh, that's because in the years between the Tao of daily life and the Tao of happiness, just like everything else, when you are on a journey, you know, when you're doing the same thing day after day, you gain deeper understanding, you get better at something. So, you know, I wanted to write, I wanted to rewrite the story of the crying princess and make it even more accurate, make him even more uh, representative of what Zhuangzi was trying to express. In that story, it's about literally this princess who was crying her eyes out, you know, on her wedding night because she didn't want to get married. So just like it is in the West, uh, in ancient China, it was very much the obligation, the duty of the royals to wed in the interest of the kingdom in order to cement alliances in order to further a diplomatic purpose. Such was the case with the princess in question. She was forced to marry. And of course, it's to a, to a man that she knew hardly at all. So she was resistant. She didn't know what she was going into. She was fearful. So that's why she was crying. Then much, much later, uh, after the marriage had taken place, uh, the wedding had taken place, she got used to life in the palace of the king. And she experienced the, the things in that setting that were not so bad at all, were not exactly as she had feared. She slept on the royal bed and it was like nothing she had ever experienced. She felt light as a feather. She feasted, you know, at the royal table, the royal banquet, and they were delicacies that she had never 
previously tasted at any time. So she then regretted her foolish emotions prior to the wedding, crying her eyes out, fearful. And she thought that, well, I really didn't have anything to fear after all. Now, when Zhuangzi wrote about that, number one, he was writing about the fear of death that we all have. Why? Because it is the great unknown, just like marrying this complete stranger, the king was a complete unknown to the princess. That's why she didn't want to go through with it. She was fearful. And the same kind of fear grips us about death. We don't know anything about it. So scary. It's the great unknown. We don't want to die. But then once the wedding has taken place, i.e. once death has occurred, then the experience while very likely invalidates all that fear that you have before due to the unknown nature of death. So because of that, because of that depiction, it was necessary for Zhuangzi to also say a few words about the experience of the soul in the hereafter. And this is done metaphorically. So the, uh, the bed that the princess slept on is metaphorically expressing a lightness in the spiritual existence of the soul unburdened by the physical body. And remember, the physical body can, can age, can get tired, can be injured, can be sick, all kinds of pain and suffering associated with the physical body. So without that physical body, when you're just a pure spiritual entity, all of those issues go away. And the feast, the royal banquet, that is symbolic and representational to talk about how in the year after, if you had lived a life of merit, then in the year after you reap the positive rewards. Conversely, if you had done some bad things, you know, tasks, deeds of demerit, then be prepared to face the neg negative consequences arising from that as well. So whatever you do in life, your hereafter is going to resemble that to some degree. So this was the thought of the early ancient sages of the Tao. So because of that, because these ideas were already prevalent, that is the reason why when Buddhism finally came around hundreds of years later, uh, centuries after the time of Laozi and Zhuangzi, that Buddhist teachings found ready acceptance because the thought process was very similar. The ideas were very similar. So then ideas like reincarnation, karma, the wheel of samsara, cycle of birth, death and rebirth, these would all be readily accepted. Now, Further on, higher levels of Eastern thought. So this is where we get into uh, more contemplation about the soul, you know, which I hope is going to be appropriate for the end of this year. So let's talk about Fo Xing, Buddha nature. So Buddha nature means the potential in every sentient being to become Buddha. And that means to be enlightened rather than to attain some sort of deity status. To be enlightened, to become Buddha, isn't to, become, to be godlike, to attain godhood. It's to be spiritually enlightened. It's to awaken to a greater reality. So because of that, because we're just talking about the potential in every sentient being, then you are now getting away from having to, to talk about the soul. So you don't have to accept that the soul exists to believe human beings have the potential to awaken and have a spiritual experience, you know, to be spiritually enlightened. You know, that can happen whether or not you believe that the soul exists. So that's a positive move. 
and it uh, removes a kind of possible objection from the non-religious. So for, for instance, an, a, an atheist may find the soul a difficult concept to swallow. You know, I have atheist friends who will say that exact thing, uh, but even they can admit that, yeah, human beings have the potential of becoming spiritually enlightened. So no problem there. So it's much more easily accepted. So that's one higher level of Eastern thought that divorces itself from the necessity of accepting the soul. So here's another. Let's talk about ben xing, original nature. This is the pure essence of the self. This is you. This is also called zi xing, self nature. It references the true self, which means the you that is always the you, eternally you, no matter what. You can change your name, you can change your mind, you can change your memories. It doesn't matter, it doesn't change you as you. You can have a complete identity makeover, it doesn't matter, there's still a you that you know is you. So for that reason, we can also render it as true nature. So the idea here is that this is even further removed from the Buddhist context because it's not fo xing, it's not Buddha nature anymore. You don't have to accept the concept of the Buddha, the one who's awakened. This concept can stand on its own with or without additional teachings of Buddhism. Now, it's very much associated with Buddhism. It's just that it's a concept that can be accepted on the basis of common sense, logic, rationality. So, ben xing, zi xing, true nature, true self, self nature, you know, these are all synonyms. This is the understanding that was attained by the sixth patriarch of Zen Buddhism upon his own personal awakening or enlightenment. He exclaimed, as he was receiving the teaching from the fifth patriarch, he said, He said, so he exclaimed these five lines about zi xing, the self nature or the true nature. And then he said five things about them. Let me translate them for you. The beginning of uh, his exclamation, he qi, is who would have thought. And then zi xing, true nature, and then the description. He said, he exclaimed first, who would have thought that the true nature is originally clear in itself? All by itself, all in itself, the same thing that we can observe when we see the pure nature of the newborn, that is the pure nature of the original self before it became tainted by the material world. Then he exclaimed, who would have thought that the true nature is neither born nor extinguished? So unlike the human body, the true nature, the you that is you, it's not born like the body is. It doesn't die like the body does. It's just there. It's eternal. Then who would have thought that the true nature is completely self-sufficient? It's just like how the newborn came into this world with absolutely nothing. You know, no clothes, no tools, no knowledge, nothing at all. And yet, that newborn can grow up to become a very capable person, someone who contributes greatly to society and other people. So you can say that despite seemingly coming with nothing, that newborn is actually completely self-sufficient. Same thing with you, with the true nature of the self. Then, 
Huinan exclaimed, Who would have thought that the true nature is neither moved nor shaken? This is the realization that when we are moved and shaken as we go through life, that's actually not the true self. The true self is steady. It's always there. It's always immovable. Whereas our surface emotions are easily moved and shaken. When we realize the difference between those surface thoughts, emotional responses to the external world and the steadiness, the immortality, the eternal nature of the true self, we've gained a level of understanding. We understand who we truly are. And lastly, Huynan exclaimed, who would have thought that the true nature is able to produce all dharmas? All dharmas means all manifestations in one's life. That true nature, in, you know, all by itself, coming with nothing, has the ability to create everything, everything that manifests in your life. So I feel that explanation of the soul is very appropriate for the end of the year, 2018. So I'm going to, uh, as I look at the clock, I realize that we have to jump ahead to the end of our presentation. So let me just say that looking ahead, when we get, when we get together again in the beginning of 2019, here's what I want to do. I want to answer this question. How can I use the DAO to help me start 2019 in the best way possible? So the quick preview for the answer is that we're going to be using the deeper understanding of the concept in the Tao that you're already familiar with, the journey of a thousand miles. We'll break it down. We'll dig into it deeply. So I think it's going to be very helpful for the new year that's coming up. So now the summary for today. Uh, actually, it's going to be more summary, more like a preview for our next meeting. It's going to be on the journey of a thousand miles. So these four characters that you see here, first character means thousand, second character means mile, and then we have the character for apostrophe S, yes, and then we have the character for journey. So thousand miles journey, journey of a thousand miles. So the what we're going to talk about next time where are you now in your personal journey? Always a good idea to contemplate where you are, where you've been, where you are going. Then look ahead and tap into the Tao wisdom in a mindful way. So it's going to be seven points that we dig into next time. And there's a lot to talk about with these points. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, to end the presentation for now, and then we can pick it up again on the seven points next time. And here the, uh, here's the ending slide that I mentioned at the beginning of our meeting today, that we need sort of a proper way to begin and end. So this is what I thought of for the ending, uh, that the presentation may have come to an end, but your journey is just beginning. So until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.